So before we get started talking about higher cortical areas and, um, and also kind of recapping some of the discussion, um, I'm just curious to hear what some of the things were that you all talked about, what were some of the things that were interesting, or even some questions um, or comments about the book that you didn't bring up in your discussion section. So I'll spend 40 minutes talking about it. So <laughs> Okay, well, good. I won't. That's good. Then, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's a lot of a lot of text to read for not a whole lot of points. So I appreciate everybody reading it, um, and, uh, and uh, hopefully, get, the, the goal was to give a perspective on uh, reorganization and plasticity, which is a theme for a lot of the part of the units in this semester, um, but. Uh, but uh, give it sort of a, a human perspective and a particular story or you know, a group of stories, I guess, because she worked with some other people. Um, were there anything, was there anything that, that came up in the discussions that surprised anybody or that you hadn't thought of or that was just, you know, just something that somebody else in your group said that you don't have to say who said it and just uh, what, uh, what was interesting came out? <laughs> yeah, I don't know what that's all about. Um, I'm not complaining, but you know. yeah. So um, I guess maybe in terms of specifics, what about um, this idea of LTP that she that she talked about? Uh, what? Um, how does that sort of play into her story and her uh, and her the, the way that her brain changed uh, from before versus after? Yeah, sure. It was definitely like a kind of a like a real life example of how LTP can like really affect your brain and its wiring. Mm -hmm. And I feel like yeah. her kind of having that happen and being able to see like day by day the kind of effect of being able to induce kind of this LTP to try to strengthen her other eye. Yeah, yeah. It was very like it was very interesting. Yeah. So, and uh, we'll probably hit on this, uh, hit on this a little bit in your discussion sections. But we had something drawn up before. So, if we have a, a side view of some chunk of visual cortex, then you're going to have an area that's left eye, right eye, left eye, right eye. Um, and here in layer four, uh, where the input from the thalamus first comes in, the cells are pretty sharply distinguished um, between left and right only. Um, but for most of us, the, the line sort of blurs up in layer two, three, and also down in the deeper layers. And it's really just in layer four that this is here. Um, and so before reading her story, I would have said that for, um, for a normal person who had normal uh, stereo vision, there's some sort of crossover and and, um, and combined inputs, um, but that in a person like Dr. Barry, who has no um, who has no stereo vision, um, there's a sharp boundary here. Still in layer two, three, there's a sharp boundary, and left only gets left, and right only gets right. Um, but she had this idea about LTP and actually even a little bit about silent synapses, and so how does that kind of into this. How, how would, so if this is the model that we used to have where there's no there's no longer a connection from this cell that's getting left eye input up to this cell that's over slightly on the right eye side and vice versa. How would we change that? If, yeah, sure. Yeah, there would be a boundary, but the, the, uh, I guess the left side going to the right side and the uh, right side to the left, there would be, instead of a be a silent synapse. Yeah, so instead of, I'll just create SS for silent synapse because there's not a lot of space here, but so instead of there being no connection, her idea was that there is still a physical connection there, um, and that physical connection has just gone silent, and so 
um, in terms of her perceptual capacity and her brain function, it's not really there and not really of any use to her, um, except that, uh, like we were talking about in the long-term potentiation unit, um, if you have a physical connection, it's a lot easier to add receptors to an existing physical connection than it is to grow a whole new connection. And so that's the idea for, um, for how she was thinking about LTP fitting in with this. Um, any questions or comments about that idea? Anything in particular that came up in the group discussions about that idea in particular? Okay, and so another um, uh, another issue is um, this idea of attention and neuromodulators. So how does that kind of play into her story? This is one of the last questions on the homework assignment. Sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so um, there's, we come over, come over here a little bit for a second and draw a brain with the brain stem. We haven't talked about neuromodulators very much, but, um, but in, your, uh, in your brain stem, there are various areas where there are clusters of cells um, that produce different, um, all of those other neurotransmitters, or a lot of those other neurotransmitters that we talked about. So we spent a lot of time in Unit 1 talking about glutamate and in Unit 2, which is the excitatory neurotransmitter. Um, we spent a little bit of time talking about GABA, which is the inhibitory neurotransmitter. But there are others. Serotonin. Dopamine. Um, and norepinephrine. Um, among many, many others, a couple dozen other neurotransmitters. And these are all made in cells that are in the brainstem. So you might have a group of cells here that make dopamine and send that dopamine sort of all throughout the brain. Um, and then another group of cells here that make serotonin and they send their axons all throughout the brain as well and project and, and release serotonin. Um, and we know from, uh, from experiments where we look at uh, synapses in isolated brain tissue that if you add dopamine or serotonin or norepinephrine, you can often make it easier to get long-term potentiation. Uh, and so the fact that she's motivated that's going to trigger the release of a lot of these neurotransmitters, and then that release is going to make it easier for her brain to change than um, if she's not motivated. Um, and this is one of the things that I think uh, makes it hard to study this type of plasticity in an adult brain, because um, in, a, in an adult brain, there's um, in an adult animal, it's hard to give them instructions and say, okay, now look at this string and get your eyes to line up and try and point both eyes at this little ball on the string at the same time. They don't, under they don't understand language. You can't tell them what to do. And so the animal um, can't follow this sort of complex set of instructions. Um, and so that means then that the animal can't be motivated, can't keep up the motivation. You can't explain to it. You know, I, yeah, I was a jerk and I cut your muscles so that your eyes misaligned and now you can't see three dimensions. But I'm going to fix it now. You just have to listen to me and follow these instructions and look at the ball on the string and all this business. Um, you can't communicate that to the animal. Uh, and, so, and so getting the animal to get motivated to look at the ball on the string, and even if you can sort of somehow manage to train it to point its eyes at that, um, that hours and hours of work that it's going to take to rewire its brain is something that it's not going to be able to keep up any motivation for. Does that idea kind of make sense, this motivational issue? Um, and so the, and that's, and that's very much related to this idea of these neuromodulators. Um, and so one of the, um, 
one of the things that uh, I also asked a little bit about was um, was the difference between monocular deprivation and um, and strabismus. Um, and so, with monocular deprivation, you're essentially just cutting out all of the inputs from one eye entirely. And so then the right eye, if the left eye is the one that's been deprived, then the right eye takes over the whole cortex. And so one consequence of that is that you don't have binocular vision, but a bigger consequence of that is that you're blind in your left eye. And sort of a side effect of being blind in your left eye is you don't have two functional eyes. Um, and so, I, and again, I want to just kind of emphasize the importance of keeping track of the difference between monocular deprivation, where you are, um, your brain becomes completely unresponsive to one of your eyes, and uh, and the the other eye grows out and takes over um, the areas of cortex that were dedicated to that uh, first eye, to to the one that would have eventually been dedicated to the left eye, get taken over by the right if you if you covered up the animal's left eye. Uh, and this is actually going to relate to um, tomorrow when Megan talks about um, the auditory system. Um, after she gives an introduction to the auditory system, she's going to talk about a study that looks at um, people and the reorganization of their auditory uh, and visual inputs, um, where if people are deaf, then um, some of the visual uh, uh, input ends up m sort of moving all the way into the uh, auditory cortex. Um, and that and that they can actually have some detectable effects on what happens um, after this cochlear implants that she'll be talking about. Um, and so that's a much sort of broad, big scale reorganization. But when you have chunks of your brain that are going unused because you've lost a sensory input, then those those areas of the brain will um, find some other sense to um, to come into them. And reorganize um, and, and, and reorganize their, themselves into that area, um, and so uh, and so that's um, you know so so uh, this is the, the monocular deprivation is sort of a small scale version of that. People born deaf is a little bit bigger. Um, where actually I think I may have said that backwards, but the, yes, the visual input moves into the auditory cortex if they're born deaf, as well as still being in the visual cortex because you've got this unused auditory cortex that's not getting any sensory input. And so some visual input routes itself there, so that the brain gets, so that all the brain real estate gets gets used by something. Um, so that's monocular deprivation, um, and then so um, so in sort of comparing that to strabismus, um, what's you know what's sort of different about strabismus as compared to this monocular deprivation? Um, sure, yes. Do you still have those connections, but they're just very. Silent. Yeah, that's so. That's I guess actually would sort of be the second point I would make is that strabismus you still have the connections. The bigger point is in strabismus, the left eye still works on its own, and the right eye still works on its own. Um, and then secondary to that, there are still connections that exist between them, but that we. But so the main point about this about this um, strabismus is that. Each eye is fully functional, and each eye is completely wired up to the visual cortex, the way it's supposed to be, at least in the early stages. It's just that you've got these silent connections, um, apparently, between uh, at the, at these border cells that normally would be binocular. Um, so unlike monocular deprivation, where one eye becomes essentially useless because your cortex has forgotten how to respond to that eye, so even if you open it again, the cortex is going to be able to respond to it. In, um, in uh, strabismus, the, um, the cortex knows perfectly well how to respond to the right eye, it's perfectly well how to respond to the left eye, it just can't bring those images together. Um, okay, and so, and so that, and, and one of the things that, as a community, neuroscience had, uh, so, so, well, let me back up a little bit. It's, it's a little hard to induced to make a, a cat strabismic um, because of the surgery. And it's actually, in, in addition to that, it's um, you, it's harder to sort of see the reorganization that happens. Um, if you cover an eye and the animal loses input entirely to that eye, then that is a much more dramatic reorganization, 
where the um, inputs from the thalamus spread out more, the, the representation in the cortex of the eye that's open expands a lot, and the representation of the other one shrinks. And so the, the monocular deprivation idea is a sledgehammer approach, which is, um, which is often um, a really useful thing if you want to study how a system changes. Um, in, if I want to know, for example, are NMDA receptors necessary for the reorganization? Um, if I have a really big obvious change, then it's really easy to um, take an animal that's lacking some part of its NMDA receptors and cover an eye and see if that's different from the normal animal. And so it's, with a big obvious change, it's a lot easier to study it. Uh, and so for, um, for most of the time since the 70s, when these, um, when the strabismus and, and monocular deprivation were first done, uh, people really just looked very, very, um, uh, spent, spent um, almost the entire body of research was all done on, on, on monocular deprivation, covering an eye, losing the input entirely to that, and letting the other one grow out. Um, and so, and then the assumption was that, that whatever we see there is likely to be the same for other types of reorganization. Um, and so the fact that we never saw animals relearn how to see out of the eye that was closed during the critical period um, led to the idea that changes that happen during that early critical period are never going to be undone again. Um, and people said, okay, well, we, we've got good evidence of that from monocular deprivation. It's hard to study really carefully in strabismus, so we'll just, again, uh, we're just gonna leave it, we're just gonna say, okay, so the same thing's probably true there in strabismus too. Um, and that's what led to the idea that there's no way to reorganize um, after, after you sort of get to be a couple years old as a human or a couple months old as a cat or whatever. Um, and so, um, and that's really one of the core things that Dr. Berry's story and the others that she cites in the book that are like hers call into question. It's the idea that um, it may be really adult brains can change. And it might have to do with neuromodulators, it might have to do with existing synapses that weren't, that weren't lost, that were just sort of silenced. Um, but, um, but sort of the crucial core point of that is that um, adult brains are more plastic, more able to reorganize themselves. Um, than, than, uh, than we had thought. They're less changeable than young brains, but they're not completely set in stone the way we sort of thought for decades based on these, these sort of sledgehammer approach of monocular deprivation where it seems like it never changes. And maybe that's right for monocular deprivation. Maybe there's no way to get that eye back. We don't know. Uh, it doesn't seem like there's a way to get that eye back. But that doesn't mean that it extends to every other type of reorganization. And that's sort of the one of the, the core points from that book. Um, what other questions do people have about any of that? Or questions in general about um, either the reading, uh, the book in general, or, um, or what I talked about last time in terms of the inputs, um, and the, you know, the one eye and the other eye, and um, left LGN, right LGN, all of that. Any questions about that? Yeah, sure. I was just wondering, I haven't had time to look at this yet. What do reviews say about the book, like, from other neuroscientists? Um, so, uh, so well, the person who's reviewed it the most extensively is Oliver Sacks, who's um, very well known as a person who is um, writes for popular um, consumption about neuroscience, um, and he has some pretty fantastic but true stories about different kinds of changes. And um, if you want to, if you just want to get some um, more things like this that are kind of entertaining and also interesting and give you some insight into neuroscience, then I would definitely recommend he has uh, like 10 or 12 books now that he's published. Um, uh, and he's you know, very positive about it. He's, you know, forward and everything. Um, the, I haven't seen, so the, the, the sort of neuroscience circles that I run in, um, so to speak, are all, um, are all people who do animal studies, and 
the problem, well, I guess there's two, there's two things. So, so one is, there is, I think not because of this book, but because of a lot of other research, um, and certainly well in line with this book, um, there is a growing um, consensus in the last 10 years, um, maybe 15 now, that adult brains are more changeable than adult. Um, and that is something that you see um, uh, across all neuroscience, and there's growing research in, it's, it's not even a question of can adult brains change anymore, it's now kind of a question of how do adult brains change, and what are the differences between adult brains and young brains, and why is it harder, and what can we do, what changes can we make that allow adult brains to become more plastic again, um, and this has dozens of medical applications from Alzheimer's disease to spinal cord injury to ALS and on and on. Um, and, and so um, it's now, um, there, there, there are, there's a recognition that we were right, that there are some substantial barriers to a lot of different types of reorganization in adult brains, um, but, uh, but, that, um, but that, that doesn't mean it's impossible the way that, that uh, 40 years ago was sort of the consensus. Um, and so, I, I think that that's not quite a direct result of this book, but, but um, a lot of neuroscientists that I know um, who are aware of this book will say, yeah, that sounds right. I think, that, I think that that seems totally reasonable, and that fits very much in line with what we're sort of learning more and more about. And so, you know, I think, I think to that extent, it's, it's well received. It's not, um, you know, it's not a rigorous sort of like clinical control trial. Um, her story was published as a case study in, in a peer-reviewed journal. Um, and and uh, and that is like one more in mounting pieces of evidence that adult brains are reorganizable in ways that we didn't appreciate 30 or 40 years ago. So um, so I wouldn't say that the book itself is sort of revolutionizing neuroscience um, because but it is sort of um, in line with a lot of what we already expect and what's going on. So yeah yeah I have like an isolated answer for that. Yeah sure the place where I work this. One neurologist comes in, he's kind of a jerk anyways, but <laughs> he um, saw me reading it and he thinks it's like overly optimistic. Uh, well, he also hates Oliver Sacks. So. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I mean, so there are people who think that, that these stories <coughs> for popular press are um, too, are too narrative and not scientific enough. So, yeah. Um, but, and, and yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that that's fair too. That, um, just because it worked for her doesn't mean it's, it's going to work for everybody. And again, that's why it's like an isolated case, right? It's an isolated case, and so it worked for one person. But um, and right, I think he yeah. thinks it's almost like deceitful that this is what the general public sees, like uh, a case study, yeah. instead of getting a more general. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's fair. I don't, I don't know that I have anything directly to say against that. Um, I think that, I mean, like anything, it's it's probably got a bit of a mixed reception, but. Um, yeah, other questions about, about that, or about any of the stuff from last class period as well. Um, okay, so, so I wanted to, the last topic, and then actually I, I didn't bring the slides because I just wanted to do this with the board here, but the last topic that we had from last class period that I skipped over in the interest of time was um, higher cortical areas and what happens to visual information after we leave primary visual cortex. <clears throat> um, and so here, you've got your two eyes, um, left eye and the right eye. Um, and this part of the right eye is going to be seeing the right visual field. This is also seeing our right visual field, um, left visual field, left visual field. And so all of this is going to end up in our left LGN. Um, and here, um, individual cells are monocular. So while we've got input from both eyes coming into this 
structure as a big structure, it's made up of thousands of cells, and each one of them is only aware of what the right, what the left eye is seeing, or what the right eye is seeing. Uh, and then the same sort of thing goes on over here, over to our right, LGN, uh, again, cells from binocular. And then from here, in the left LGN, are uh, say our left eye axons, the axons from the cells that got left eye inputs, are going to find their way into layer four. This is all of visual cortex, V1. Um, and here in layer four, again, we have monocular, not only monocular cells, but we actually have these monocular zones in layer four, um, where the cells over here are all left eye, and then all of these are the right eye axons. And all of those cells are getting right eye input. So this is left visual cortex, it is seeing all of the right visual field. Everything to the right of where your everything to the right of where your eyes are pointed. Um, and at the level of layer four, the cells are individually either sensitive to the left eye or the right eye. And then up in layer two, three, this is where you start to get the binocular cells. The ones that first form a uh, uh, um, fused combined image. So we've got axons sort of spanning out here from layer four up to these cells down there. Um, over here, same thing is happening. mirror image thing is happening. Uh, so here's our layer four. This is the input layer. All the cells are monocular. Um, and then the lines blur above and below. And up in layer two, three, which is our processing layer, that's where we start to see our first binocular cells. <clears throat> Any questions about this? So again, we've got uh, left eye, right eye, um, and all of this is going to be left visual field, um, which is in the right primary visual cortex. Okay, what questions do people have about any of that organization there? Okay, and so then we also talked about from layer two, three, Axons go down to layer five and layer six. Draw a circle around our LGNs here so we can keep track of them. Layer six is the feedback communication um, to, uh, in the case of the visual system, it's feedback to the LGN. In the case of somatic sensory system, it would be feedback to the VPN and VPM of the thalamus, which are areas you don't need to know. In the case of the auditory system, layer six, so the auditory cortex is going to go back to the medial genicular nucleus, or MGN, um, which you'll learn about tomorrow. Uh, and so, in general, this is feedback to thalamus, in particular for the visual system, that happens to be the LGN. Um, same thing over here, we've got um, layer six, which is our feedback, 
and so it brings you down to layer six and then back over here. Um, and then in addition to that, layer five is the sort of all-purpose rest of the output. And since the inputs are already getting dual I input to layer five and six, these are also going to be binocular structures. They're aware, in, in the deep layers, the, the cells are aware of both eyes um, independently, or both eyes together, each cell. So most of the cells have some responsiveness to both eyes. Um, okay, so what questions do people have about any of that? Um, yeah, sure. Uh, is that one right visual too? I'm sorry, can you say that again? Uh, is the block on the right meaning right visual field at the top? Um, so you put LVS at the top of that right. Yeah, no, that's that's correct because it's seeing the left visual field um, in the right visual cortex. So so over here, my left visual field hits the right side of my retina, and then that's going to end up in my right thalamus and the right side of my brain. So the right side of my brain is processing everything on the left side of where I'm looking. But everything. This is this the flip. Yeah. That's, that's, that's sort of the, where the flip is. Um, so, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that's, that's an important thing to keep straight. Um, okay, and so, uh, and so this layer five output, so here, let's draw. So this would be, um, if I'm looking this way, this is a view of my left hemisphere. Um, and this little chunk, so over here, over here in my left hemisphere, this is all V1. This little chunk that we're looking at is like a tiny, tiny little segment of V1. Something like that. So we've taken this little chunk, and instead of looking at it top down, we've turned it so we're looking at it sideways so we can see all the layers, right? Because remember, up here, this is the skull. And then this is the deep in my brain part. Up here, this is the skull. And the deep in my brain part. So, so we've turned that um, on its side so that we can look at it here. But now this little chunk, and then all of the little chunks, uh, are going to be sending their, their axons out to various other targets. And it's in particular, the layer 5 cell. And so, uh, and we can also draw, we could also look at my right hemisphere. And again, here's all of V1. Here's this little chunk of my right hemisphere that we've been looking at. And again, from V1, the layer five cells are sending their axons out to other parts of the brain. Um, and there are a lot of other parts out there that are gonna be processing visual information. But the two main pathways out are in toward the temporal lobe um, and this is called the ventral stream. Um, uh, ventral refers to sort of stomach side and if I'm a four-legged creature then the bottom of my brain is on the same side of the body as my stomach um, and so that's where that comes from. Uh, and then so it's going into the temporal lobe. And as we talked about uh, a couple classes ago, the temporal lobe is involved in object identification. There are specific areas that are dedicated in humans to identifying faces, and then other areas that are dedicated to identifying um, other objects that are locally nearby. Our auditory cortex is gonna project into those areas as well and give us information about who somebody is based on the sounds they make and their voice. Um, our uh, somatosensory cortex can project into those areas so I can tell the difference between a piece of chalk and, um, and a piece of paper or something by the feel of them. And so, uh, and so but, but a big chunk, a, a big, uh, a, a major aspect of object identification comes from sounds and, um, and, uh, and sight. Actually, one other area that projects in 
uh, that's a little hard to see, but sort of deep within the temporal lobe is also our olfactory cortex, and smells of something can also play, play a role in, um, in how we identify them as well. And so collectively, the sights, the sounds, the smells, um, those are the key senses that we mostly rely on to figure out what things are. Um, and we sometimes call this the what pathway, because the question is, what am I seeing? What's out there? What's that object? Or who? If it's a person. Any questions about that? Um, okay, and then uh, the second pathway, so this is again from layer five, our output is going to be to ventral stream and also to the dorsal stream, as well as a dozen or so other areas in the brain, but we're just going to focus on these two. Um, and so going up this way into the parietal lobe is what's called the dorsal stream. Um, dorsal refers to back, because again, if I'm a four-legged creature, the top is the same side of my body as the back. Um, and so this is going into the parietal lobe. And this is involved in figuring out location. So we sometimes call it the where pathway. And also um, motion. And we sometimes call that the how pathway. Um, so if I want to throw something up and catch it, then I need to know where it is, how it's moving, the speed it's moving at, and I also need to know where my hands are, um, which comes from my primary somatosensory cortex here, that's also going to project it into this space. Know where my hands are, and then get my hand to the same point in space at some time in the future um, as this object, and then close around. And that plan begins to be made in the, um, in the parietal lobe. Um, and then just next to this, but technically in the next lobe over, is motor cortex. And so what this, this parietal projection is going to then project up to parts of the frontal lobe, which then project into motor cortex, so sort of our premotor areas over here. And then we're going to be able to make a movement based on the collective information, mostly from our visual and somatosensory systems. Um, occasionally, with some work, we can figure out where something is by its sound as well, and we'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a couple days on Thursday. So that's sort of the overall pattern of things and where they go. Um, and then, so just to complete this auditory cortex and we'll talk more about this right now. So I, I introduced a lot of this already a couple class periods ago, but I wanted to return to it in the context of the visual system. Um, so what questions do people have about all of that? And how did, like, so this is all coming from layer five of visual cortex, and that's where the output's going to these two streams are. So what questions do people have about that? Um, okay, so that's, uh, that's, um, if for the visual system for today, we'll be talking about the auditory system tomorrow. Make sure that we have your homework from Fixing My Gaze and also your quiz before you uh, take off. And I will see you all um, tomorrow morning. Uh, and uh, Megan will be talking about the auditory system.
Oh, you were there at 910. Okay, so you made most of it. Okay, I, I, I guess I didn't miss, I, I, I didn't look at my clock right after I helped you. So, so I think you should probably be fine. Um, um, we, I, I'll, I'll check in with Amanda and see if there's, um, if, if there's parts that you missed, and then we can maybe, I just might send you an email of like, you know, these are the points that they talked about while you were gone or something like that. So, but yeah, okay, cool. Thanks, see you later. So I saw, I peeked in on yours a little bit. Oh. I like things were going well. The students, every time, I, every time I looked in, the students were always talking. So okay. that's good. <laughs> that's good, yeah. They, um, we had a good discussion. Everyone was um, talking a good amount. Nice. Um, the only, yeah, the only thing was she was a little late, but I think she was just like maybe a little bit lost. But she, she still like contributed. Okay, good. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I might, I, I'll, um, so, so did she, um, I guess, like, <laughs> um, did, uh, uh, was, um, were there, what were you talking about in that first 15 minutes before she got there? We, um, were talking mainly about, um, what people thought about the, like, existence of the, like, critical period. Okay. Um, 